personal views and opinions expressed by our podcast guests are their own and are not legal advice or official statements by their organizations. Hello, my name is Debbie Reynolds. They call me the Data Diva. This is the Data Diva Talks Privacy Podcast, where we discuss data privacy issues with industry leaders around the world with information the businesses need to know now. I have a special guest on the show, Joyce Hunter. She is the Executive Director of the Institute for Critical Infrastructure Technology. Welcome. Thank you, Debbie. Appreciate the opportunity to be on your Data Diva show. Yeah. Well, you caught my attention, caught my eye on LinkedIn. And I thought, oh my goodness, I should reach out. You work a lot with women in cybersecurity and I've done a couple of events with them internationally. So it's always of interest to me when I see women, especially women of color in this area, definitely having a strong voice in technology. I would love for you to introduce yourself. Tell me about <laughs> about your role and your journey in cybersecurity and some of the things that you work on at the ICIT. ICIT is a nonprofit 5013C think tank, and we focus primarily on cybersecurity, national security, and critical infrastructure, particularly those that are people-focused. And we have a people-focused mission, and those areas are food and agriculture, healthcare, water, and finance. And we have been a think tank for about 10 years. We're going into our 10th year, if you could believe that. But we survived COVID and everything else, and we are coming back out stronger. We typically have our major fundraiser benefit for the year, which is the gala, which is the most sought after ticket in the DC area. We have probably somewhere around the neighborhood of 75,000 to 80,000 people in our database. We have a digital library that is free to everyone who is a member of ICIT. So we have 10 years of research and development. So if you're a college student or a nonprofit or anybody else that is interested in what we do and some of the speakers that we have had, please feel free to go to our website and take a look at our research. There's lots of information, everything from software built of materials all the way through workforce and cybersecurity. So we are really excited about what we do and serving the American people. That's tremendous. That's tremendous. How did you get into this field? What motivated you to move into this technology area? I'm an accidental tourist. Um, I don't have a technical background at all. My undergraduate degree is in sociology, which does help if you're in this business to be able to understand and study people and marketing. My MBA is in marketing. I thought for sure when I graduated from Wharton that I was going to be a marketer. I always say man plan, God laughs. And I started out as a market research person for Hallmark Cards. Yes, me. I was a card designer and developer. You got to have a sense of humor when you do those. So I had my first card series was Halloween. How much more fun can you get than that? That's true. So back then we didn't have the internet and we didn't have laptops. And we used to have to go to each of the card stores and count the cards that were left. After and then put it into a system and it would give us these nice little punch cards that you hope you never dropped. And then it would spit out all of the best of the past, worst of the past. So that's what I thought I was going to be doing. But as luck would have it, I was transferred to who I was married to at the time was in technology and we were transferred to Colorado Springs, Colorado. And I was looking for a job and happened to see a job for a business development trainee. And that's how I got my start. That's amazing. That's amazing. I know you work with women in cybersecurity. 
Tell me about your work there, your interests there. I really like the organization. I've done some, quite a few things. So I actually get called a lot from women in cybersecurity in other countries. So I've done Saudi Arabia, I've done Canada, different places. But tell me about your role in women in cybersecurity. I am one of the mentors in women in cybersecurity. And so for a certain period of time back in the fall, I had a cohort of women where we would meet every three weeks or so, and they would give us an agenda that we could walk through with them. So by the end of the course itself, which was about six weeks, then each of the women should have given me the opportunity to review their elevator pitch, to help them refine it and to help them work on their resumes. Amazing still that a lot of people believe that they can have one resume for every single opportunity that they go after. And that doing a resume is a lot of work and that you have to customize it for the job that you are pursuing. Because after you've been around as long as I've been around, then you have a lot of different facets to your career that may fit in one particular area and may fit in others. So you do have to have that And I'm still working with some of them. Some of them actually call and I've tried your suggestions and this didn't work or that didn't work. And we will sit down and go over together. So I build relationships. I don't build this transactional. I build long-term relationships where I stay in contact with people. I was with Lotus Development Corporation way back in the day. And I used to work with Ray Ozzy and I helped in the development and implementation of Lotus Notes with Ernst & Young International. And I still stay in touch with those people. Most of them have become partners and now have gone off, you know, retired. And I'm still in touch with them. And I build long-term, resilient, stable, fun relationships. And that's what I do with women in cybersecurity. That's a tremendous work. So I really applaud you for your mentorship. And I can tell you're really amazing at it. I want your thoughts about just women in tech. So I've had this debate a lot. I like to do these types of programs because I always hear people say, well, why do we need a women in group? of anything. And so a lot of times I have to sit down and school them as to why that is important. But what are your thoughts about why it's important to have some of these women in groups, like women in cybersecurity? Because we need to see ourselves in these areas and in these positions. A lot of times we go to the meetings and it's usually one of us, either ethnic or relationship instances. In a lot of cases, we kind of sit in the corner and we're not heard. We're not given a voice. We're talked over, talked under, talked through. And when we have these women in organizations, then we can talk about some of the challenges that we are facing in those organizations, whether it's women in agriculture, whether it's women in cybersecurity. So we have a forum and a venue so that we can actually support each other and give each other advice and recommendations on how we might be able to overcome some of those challenges. What are some of the things that are concerning you when you hear, when you talk to people, women who are trying to break into like cyber or privacy or technology fields? I have a thought too, I can tell you. What I do is I tell them that first of all, they need to go to some of these industry meetings, any of them. It doesn't matter which one it is, so that they can get educated and become knowledgeable and that they can meet people half the time. And I think COVID did us a big disservice where we could not get out in front of people and actually get to know, like I said, building those sustainable relationships. That is extremely important because you have to show yourself as knowledgeable. If you're on the phone, sometimes it's very hard to get a word in edgewise, particularly if you have a very strong personality who who consumes all of the air on a virtual call. And so when you are in front of a person or if you publish, put things out on LinkedIn, put things out in other mediums, like for instance, ICIT, we have a group of fellows that contribute to our digital library. And I write I write to an organization called My Rural America because I used to be the deputy CIO and then the acting CIO at the Department of Agriculture. So people have come to know me over the years because of 
where I was and what I did in the past. And I like to encourage women that are coming behind me to do the same thing. I'll take them by the hand and say, okay, we're going to this meeting. And if you have a thought or an idea, I want you to put your hand up. And sometimes a lot of it is because you don't get that opportunity for exposure. You are kept in the back room in the back office, or else you're afraid to say something because you think you might sound stupid. I hate that word, but that's what we have been taught to think. Be quiet and only speak when you're spoken to. That doesn't work in this world. If you don't speak up, you're not going to get noticed. You're not going to get your thoughts out. Don't leave a meeting saying, I should have said. Well, you should have. And have your argument set up. Somebody is going to disagree with you. Don't be afraid of it. Lean into it and make your points known. That's amazing advice that I think anyone can use. One thing that I tell women in technology is that, just like you say, you have to speak up. No one's going to speak up for you. No one can tell your story like you can. And I think some people feel like, oh, I work so hard. I do these things and then people are going to notice and they're going to present me forward somehow to other people. And we know that that's not the way it goes. So being able to really be able to tell your story. And now it's easier than it's ever been. So I remember back in the day, way back in the day, if you want to publish something, you had to have a relationship with an editor or publisher. And now everyone, you can have your own form, your own voice, post your own stuff on LinkedIn, put your own thought leadership out there. And that's really vital. Absolutely. Nobody's going to do it for you. And you have to speak up for yourself because everybody has good ideas. There is no such thing as a bad idea. There are some ideas that need to be kept in the oven a little bit longer, but that doesn't mean it's a bad idea. That means that you put it out in the universe and somebody will come along and aid you in getting that solution or that idea fully baked. Absolutely. I want your thoughts on cybersecurity and privacy. So cybersecurity and privacy are different, as we know, but cybersecurity and privacy have a symbiotic relationship, in my view. But tell me your thoughts about either comparing or contrast or the differences you see there. I think privacy is where you have the ability to keep things, particularly data and particular types of data, out of the eyes and ears of the general public, whether it is healthcare or whether it's educational or other things like that. So there are certain data points that should always be private. Your social security number, your Medicare number. Those are the things that are private. The other one, you said privacy and data? Cybersecurity. Privacy and security. Okay. So security, it could be physical or it could be logical. So the physical security is if you are securing the football stadium, say uh, the Lincoln Field in Philadelphia. I'm an Eagles fan. I'll put it out there. So uh, you can secure a facility. You can secure an individual as far as secret service. That's physical security. Then there's the logical security, which is, again, going back to data and going back to keeping that data out of the eyes and ears and fingers of other people. Ransomware, you can do a lot of harm, and that is the security piece of it. And it's also privacy. So you can have your privacy and your security interrupted because somebody took liberties with the physical security of software or hardware. So I think that there is a big difference. There's the people part of it, which could be the physical security. And there is the logical part, which is physical and logical. Very good. I agree with that. And, you know, interestingly enough, I'm going to add this one to it. This is what the SEC is trying to get public organizations to understand is, yeah, you can be hacked, but your stakeholders need to know. And what they said is, you have four days. You have four days to report this so that people can make the appropriate protections. 
so that their information is not floating out there in the ether. And all of a sudden they get a call from somebody who has gotten hold of their information and sounds like a real person, but it's not anymore. So I think that you can't run and you can't hide from it. You have to report in four days. Now, something I thought was hilarious two weeks ago was a company was hacked, ransomware. They took too long to give the attackers the answer. So the bad guys went to the SEC and reported the victim. I mean, how weird is that? So now you have the bad guys reporting the victims if you don't respond in time. And a lot of people think, oh, it's not going to happen to me. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, because you will be attacked, period, plain and simple. That's just life these days. That's so true. Right. And I think the companies that have the hardest time are the ones who think that they cannot be hacked or it can't happen to them. So yes, yes, yes. My thing is, let's say if someone broke in to your establishment. Once they got in, how much damage could they actually do, right? That's a lot around people's internal processes and controls and who has access. Yes. When you call, I call it cyber physical. So that's a combination of both. You could get the integration of physical and digital systems, which can allow for real-time monitoring and control, especially in agriculture processes. You need to be able to protect things from the dirt to the table. And all of that revolves around both physical and digital systems being protected. Yeah. I want your thoughts on kind of risk-based approaches to cybersecurity. We hear those terms a lot, but I tell people risk is about kind of activity over time. So if you're taking a risk-based approach, you need to be able to show your maturity. What are you doing over time to be able to mitigate or answer those risks. And if you are, let's say, for instance, you had a breach in the U.S. and you had to report something to the SEC, a lot of what they're going to be asking about is like, what did you do before this? (laughs) What did you have in place before? So what are your thoughts there? That's right. That's right. It's like when a child gets into trouble, right? And the parent or the teacher asks, so what did you do? to precipitate this kind of action. And it's the same thing with risk-based approach. There's no such thing as taking a test once a year and this makes you cyber ready or cyber secure. There are the tabletop exercises. There are the interactive tests. I mean, very seldom do you see CBTs anymore for people to just go through and check off and say, okay, you know, I've taken the test for this year. I got to wait until next year to take the test. And it doesn't work that way. There are a lot of scenario-based exercises that you can take because everybody learns differently. And I think if a risk-based approach, you need to cover everything. Those that learn by doing, the kinetic learner, those that learn by hearing, you can have them study a scenario and then repeat it back to you with a solution a team-based approach where you're hearing, learning, and doing, where you give them a problem. And then, of course, there's a right answer, but then there are various ways in which you can overcome. There's the, I always call it the lockout room. Almost like the escape room. Thank you. That's the word, the escape room. Those are a lot of fun. The first time I did one with my grandson, I think he was probably about... 10 or 12 years old, he beat all of us. I mean, you know, so so you have to have a variety of different ways to meet that risk-based approach. One way is not going to do it every single year because people get used to it and they pretty much figure out what the answer should be on a multiple choice test without even reading the materials or internalizing it. I agree with that. I agree. I want your thoughts about what's happening in the world right now that's concerning you about either cyber or privacy? What's coming up when you say, oh, wow, I don't know about this one? (laughs) Oh, gosh. I think it is the systems that affect people the most. A couple of weeks ago when we had that breach on the water systems in Pennsylvania and Texas, 
It goes back to also agriculture, goes back to health care. Anything that touches a person, telehealth, if somebody could get in, not giving anybody any ideas, but if anybody could get in and adjust the chemical compound of somebody who is receiving medical care at home, if somebody can go in and adjust the chemical makeup of water that we are drinking on a daily basis, if somebody can go in and adjust the chemical compounds that's going into the dirt that's growing our potatoes, tomatoes, corn, soybeans, that's a concern to me. And that people would be mean and evil enough to even think about harming their fellow man. That is really concerning. The whole geopolitical scenario makes for very, very scary situations. I think especially one of the things you just pointed out about devices. So internet connected devices, IoT devices. For example, let's say someone has a CPAP machine, a machine that helps them breathe at night. And those are set by a doctor, physician, based on the diagnosis of the person. If someone were to manipulate that, that could actually cause harm to an individual. And so the more connected devices we have, the more we need to really think about that security. Not only the security of keeping people out of those devices that aren't supposed to be in, but then also making sure people who have access are the proper people who need access. What do you think? Absolutely. What was it, Thanksgiving weekend when we had all those healthcare facilities that were breached? There were so many people that actually died. And people aren't, they're not talking about that. They're not talking about that aspect. They're only talking about, okay, you know, we, we got the systems back up and running. And I don't remember the exact number. I'll have to go look it up. But there were a number of people who actually died because their machines were cut off. They did not get the services that they were supposed to have. Dispatch going out for the ambulances, the EMTs that had to go out and actually get people to bring them back into the hospital and get serviced. They communicate with the hospital and the healthcare providers on their way in. That was cut off. So I think it's horrible that you have to have these, but unfortunately, healthcare and agriculture are two laggards, if you will, in the technology world. I understand that you make money with an MRI machine and it's paying for to secure your cybersecurity infrastructure is does not sound as appealing. I don't know whether you remember, Debbie, but remember Y2K? Oh, yeah. I was working for Lawson Software at the time. OK, and we were preparing all these healthcare facilities. For Y2K, you know what people were telling me? Oh, well, where am I going to get my ROI? Your ROI is going to come when your system stay up and running. Hello? <laughs> right. I would get complaints after Y2K. Well, nothing happened. Duh. Right. <laughs> that is the same thing right now. Invest in your cybersecurity. Ensure that your people are trained. I can't tell who it is. But there is a head of a major organization. I mean, people would be absolutely astounded that this person, the CEO of this organization, actually participates in the tabletop exercises of his company. Because he says that if he doesn't do it, how can he ensure that the people at the rank and file are actually going to do it? He wants to show how serious this is by him participating. That's what we have to get to. I agree with that. And I think there's a gap in cybersecurity training. So part of the gap that you talked about is trying to do this paint by numbers training that's very boring and it's probably out of date because cyber criminals, they're like big four accounting firms. They have call centers, they have promotions. They're very organized. So they do those trainings too. And they try to figure out what's the best way to counteract that. So we definitely have to be up on that. But then also one blind spot that a lot of organizations have, and I'm glad that you said this CEO of this company does these tabletop exercises, but it tends to be executives. So executives tend to like if you move up in a company, they tend to get additional access and not get previous access taken away from them. 
They may have assistants helping them. They tend to be, when companies get hacked, a lot of times they go for an executive because it's easier. So an executive may have more access to maybe a lower level person. But a lot of times when I see some of these trainings, they want, they're like, okay, we want the lower level people to go into all these trainings. It's like they don't even have the access to have anyone harm, do anything harmful, right? It's the people who don't want to go to training, which are these executives. They have all this access. They're not really as close to these technologies. They have access control to systems that they shouldn't be have access to, and they're just a sitting target. What are your thoughts? Absolutely. I have so many examples, Debbie. Um, oh my gosh. <laughs> so there is a top-rated college, HBCU. Went in, talked to them extensively about how they needed to cybersecure their organization. I was laughed at. And two weeks after my presentation, they were hacked. When you think about it, and I know people said HBCUs, they weren't after the students, they weren't after the money, they weren't after. Think about colleges and what they do. The federal government invests a lot of money in research, research, the latest COVID drugs, the latest malaria drugs, the latest diabetes uh, protocols. They invest a lot in not only HBCUs, but all kinds of institutions of higher learning for research. The bad guys want the research. They want to be able to best us or duplicate our drugs and sell it out on the black market. So, yeah, I have a lot of feeling about that because I think we're sitting ducks. The institutions of higher learning are not taking this as serious as they should. They think that they're after the students' money. And this particular school, it was shut down for two weeks. I have godsons that go to that school. They called me because they could not use their student cards anywhere on campus. They couldn't eat. They couldn't access any of their coursework. Nothing. I had to get up out of my bed at midnight drive down wherever I drove, not going to say, <laughs> wherever I drove, give them cash, withdraw cash out of my account, drive it down, give them cash so that they could go off campus and eat. I had to take them because nothing around the campus they could access. Isn't that amazing? The That story illustrates a huge shift in my view about technology. Dating myself, but back in the day, once I started working, this before people had emails and computers and stuff like that, technology was thought as an aid to you in your work. Now it is vital. Absolutely. I had gone to a, a restaurant. It was like a fast food restaurant and their computers were down. They were like, we can't sell you anything. We can't make anything. We can't do anything without these computers, right? So I think we need to have more respect and more awareness about how critical our reliance on technology is and be really serious. I think a lot of times in the media, maybe in, in movies, maybe we get this in movies, where it's like Tom Cruise hanging from the ceiling and all this stuff, right? And so I think people sometimes think about those more far-fetched threats Yes. As opposed to someone left Fort Knox door open. <laughs> someone just walked right through. So what do you think? Espionage is huge. It is huge. I mean, all we have to do is look at our own experiences. Remember a couple of years ago, maybe three years ago, we didn't have chicken. We couldn't get chicken. JBL, you're right. We could not get chicken because the supply chain was interrupted. We could not get fuel. When Colonial Pipeline was hacked. So it is everything is either IT or OT. Everything is becoming more consolidated. Can you imagine somebody who could get a hold of the energy grid and all of the new houses that are now being built are, I mean, everything is connected together. Right. Coffee pot goes in the morning, can't get into your house. My son put one of those electronic locks on my parents' house in Philadelphia. And I'm thinking to myself, where's the key? You know, I'm thinking, where's the key? And he's telling me all about, there's no key. You just do this. I said, 
And if the electricity goes off, there is a key. I can still have a key to get in the house. And he was mystified. He was like looking at me like, why would you need a key? We are so reliant on technology these days. If you ever, ever, ever have the opportunity to go down to the AWS facility in, what is that, Pentagon City, they will show you the house of the future. It scares me because nothing will work. Maybe I'm old school. I just want to be able to get to my creature comforts without having to worry about whether I'm going to be able to get to my house, whether a clock is going to work, any of that. So yeah, it's of great concern. I'm also concerned about that. So I like technology. I'm a technologist, but I'm not a fan of everything that people try to use in a technological way. And I'm totally with you on the locks. I have Recently had a choice. I had to replace some locks somewhere and I chose the old school. It was the same thing. It's like, what about the power? (laughs) See, see, exactly, exactly. I do appreciate being able to auto start my car on a cold morning from my house. I do appreciate that. But as far as getting into My house, I have to have a physical key or some way of being able to access something just in case. That's very smart. Very smart. So if it were the world according to you, Joyce, and we did everything you said, what would be your wish for either privacy, cybersecurity, anywhere in the world, whether it be regulation, human behavior, or technology? Standards. Standards and governance. I was the queen of governance over at agriculture. Whenever you say governance, people run, Debbie. They do. Because that makes them accountable, right? Governance makes people accountable. And people don't want to be accountable. They want to do whatever they want, whenever they want. I always have arguments with scientists who say that that electronic microscope is not IT. And I say, if it plugs into my network, it's IT. So governance and standards. Right now, it's the Wild West as far as AI. And I read, and I can't remember where, but the states themselves, Debbie, are making up their own standards. That's crazy. (laughs) That means that there's going to be no communication. I know the listening audience think we're ancient, but back in the day, Healthcare was in the same plight. IT systems didn't communicate and you couldn't go across state lines and you couldn't do this and that because there was no standards. There was no regulation until we had the HITSPE, the Health Information Technology Standards Panel. We're going to have to get to that point with AI because right now everybody is running around doing their own thing, developing their own programs. Nobody knows if there are any real ethical rules for AI development. We talk about it. But is there something that's standard that everybody has to subscribe to? No, there isn't. If I were to say, if the world according to Joyce, I get on that standards and figure it out really, really quickly, or else you're going to have a mess. I agree with that completely. Well, thank you so much for being here. It's such a treat, though. And thank you for imparting all your wise words. I totally agree. Thank you for the invitation, Debbie, and I hope you get the opportunity to do it again. Absolutely. Absolutely. Anytime. I'd be happy to collaborate with you. And since I'm a Trekkie, live long and prosper. (laughs) Live long and prosper. Thank you so much, Joyce. Bye-bye. Bye.